good morning from a very early Sweden. Uh, Mr. Jan, nice to have you on our first uh, video podcast. And uh, yeah, it would be great to uh, get into some details into uh, what you do for a living. Thanks very much. Well, um, uh, I'm a, a driver manager in uh, Australia. I manage a couple of drivers. Um, heavily involved in uh, the V8 supercar series here in Australia. So uh, my drivers are David Reynolds and, uh, and Andre Weingartner from New Zealand. Yeah, and uh, that's quite interesting. And also, I think uh, for people that, that don't know that uh, that much about V8 supercars, uh, particularly, uh, could you get into some details about what fascinated you with uh, what the sports and and uh, what got you into sort of the managing part of uh, of it? Well, in Australia, I think a lot of boys, uh, young boys, grew up um, uh, with a passion for, for cars. And uh, sometimes people wonder why Australians are so passionate about their cars and ended up producing their own local uh, cars, uh, the Holden Commodore and the, um, and the Ford Falcon. Um, and really, uh, I always told them that you know, the reason is probably because Australia is such a big country that it was absolutely critical that we had cars to get around in. If you didn't have a car, um, it was very hard to get to most places um, other than within the city. So cars became a fascination for Australians. Uh, on the back of that, motorsport grew and uh, flourished um, in the 1960s and 1970s. It became very popular and, uh, and it has been ever since. So Grand Supercars is uh, pretty much a continuation of that series. Um, it's a two-make series originally. Um, it, came as, um, it launched as a, a Ford versus Holden series officially probably 20 years ago. Um, these days we see Volvo, we see Nissans, we see uh, or have seen Mercedes, um, so we're different marks, but um, it's a very popular port, a sport in Australia. Um, we have a, a big TV audience, a big uh, live audience, and um, it's a big business sport. Mm. So, uh, and for me, being a little patriotic, uh, you know, of course, we've seen Volvo in there. And uh, I think, uh, I don't know what year it was, if it was 2014, you have uh, Robert Dahlgren over from Sweden, race with Scott. Oh, yeah. And um, from what you've seen from him, if you should talk about uh, that Swede in particular, what was your impressions of uh, that foreign driver? Well, um, we were amazed at how uh, adaptable the, the, the drivers were. I mean, this is a very different vehicle to be racing. It's a rear wheel drive. It's a high horsepower um, uh, vehicle. And uh, they're very, very unique and by all accounts, very difficult to adapt to. But uh, we had a number of uh, rounds where international drivers would be uh, invited in to be the co-drivers. So it wasn't only the, the Swedish drivers. We saw IndyCar drivers, we've seen X Formula One drivers. Um, we've seen NASCAR drivers, you know, amazing amount of drivers come over most of us and, and they're all very impressive, all very impressive. Mm, yeah, for, for instance, I think it was um, Marcus Ambrose came back before I think he retired or how was it? Well, yeah, he was racing a Ford, the Xbox Ford. Or yeah, something. yeah, well, well he, uh, he, he, he was very successful, won the championship um, many years ago and then went to NASCAR um, and came back to Australia when he retired last year and started racing in the Ford Falcon. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I think um, after maybe less than half a season, he decided to retire. Uh, perhaps he found it all too difficult to adapt to. Uh, the, uh, the evolution of these things has been significant over the past 10 years. So you can bring the best driver in the world. In fact, we saw, um, uh, you know, we've seen Moto, uh, MotoGP uh, races come over and um, try and adapt. Uh, we've seen uh, you know, successful IndyCar drivers, Formula 1 drivers come out here and adapt and they will never catch the uh, more experienced guys. Mm. Yeah, and I, th I think um, uh, when Kurt Busch, a NASCAR driver, drove for uh, Furniture Road, I think they did a test on Circuit of the Americas with uh, Fabian Coulthard and uh, James Courtney and he was Quite impressed, uh, impressed by that. And uh, when you look at it from, of course, the TV, you know, I'm not an actual driver, so I have to to look at the television. And as I as I've been talking to you before on, uh, regarding uh, the racing, it's just uh, never stops to amaze people and and, and myself uh, in particular, just due to the fact that the quality of the racing and it's not so predict predictable. And when it comes to like comparing it maybe to Formula One or other series, you know, you don't know that maybe you could have Mark Winterbottom in, in the lead and you don't know if, if he actually is going to win. So, yes, yeah, it's well, it's a very competitive series. Uh, 
look, not a lot of people know, but you know, less than one second can split first to last in amongst 25 or 26 cars. I mean, you know, that's amazing in one lap that in less than one second you can have 26 cars crossing the line at the same time. Um, the other great thing about the series is um, there's a, a parity uh, regulation. So what that means is there's a rule that tries to um, eliminate as many variables as possible to make the, um, the construction of the, the race car very similar. Um, so uh, the, the racing is very close, it's controlled. Um, but having said that, uh, even despite the parity rules, um, you know, there is infinite variables in terms of the way you build your engine, um, the way you build your, um, your suspension, uh, your aerodynamics, of course. I mean, all that's, although that's controlled, I mean, uh, every car has a slightly different shape, doesn't it? So um, it's very different, um, even though there's a lot of rules that uh, control what they can do with the car. Mm. So it's, it, would it be fair to say it is a little bit like NASCAR in that way where it comes to the relationships between teams and drivers where it's not as close as Formula One where everybody is for themselves basically or is it that you have some kind of parity where people are sharing information I don't necessarily openly but some in somewhat in some way where it benefits the team and, and drivers as a whole? Well, I think there are certain things that you can control um, and want to control the IP of, your intellectual property. Um, but there's other things that must be disclosed and, and they're controlled by the governing body being V8 supercars. So the engines, for example, although they're all um, limited to 5 litre capacity V8 fuel injected, um, there's limitations around the parts and the weights that you can put in there. So at, I believe in every, every year, every team has the opportunity to look at each other's engines. So there's not a lot of cheating that can be um, undertaken. Um, in terms of relationships, well, I find that the sport of V8 supercars is generally pretty friendly. I mean, Australians are, are generally pretty friendly anyway. But having said that, there can be a lot of anxiety um, uh, at race meetings between the drivers, um, not necessarily within the team, but um, uh, amongst other drivers. I mean, the fact is these cars are production-based style cars, so you can hit each other. Um, you're not meant to. Uh, but it's not uncommon to be banging into each other. Now, as you know, in open wheel racing or IndyCar, as soon as you hit the other competitor, you know, you break, you break your, um, your, uh, your chassis or steering rod or something like that. Mm -hmm. So here you can uh, bang into each other's panels and not necessarily uh, right the car off and you can continue racing. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of wild, wild west as well. So um, it is quite entertaining. There's a lot of theatre to it. Um, um, up until a few years ago, you know, we were still running on unleaded petrol. Now we run on ethanol, E85, uh, I think, or E10, uh, but it's a, a, an ethanol-based fuel. Um, that makes it a bit easier to be in the pits. It doesn't smell so much. It's easier for the, the pit crew to work in. Uh, but back in, a few years ago, you'd also see flames exploding out of the, uh, the exhaust pipes. Um, so there's still lots of theatre about V8 supercars. Rear-wheel drive means you know, there's lots of movement in the car. Oh, yeah. uh, you've got to, got to manage your tyre life, um, um, lots of noise. Um, so, yeah, it's, this, this, it's quite a spectacular sport, I suppose. So for that reason, it's been very, very popular in Australia and, you know, and overseas as well. Yeah, for sure. Especially for me, you know. I, I don't. Although it's early morning, it's definitely great to see because it's it definitely gets your gets your day day into a very good start. And I like your shirt. It looks good in that shirt. You seem that you are a big racing fan. Yeah, I, I thought I'd show off. Um, the guys at Momo um, gave it to uh, myself and, and Dave to wear. David's David Reynolds. He's sponsored by uh, Momo here in Australia. Oh. Um, so um, I I, um, I I kindly asked for a t-shirt. All right, that? you're smart, <laughs> man. It looks good on you, man. You should be rocking that more more frequently. I think I will. I think I will. <laughs> <laughs> and um, well, since you talked, uh, touched a little bit on Dana Reynolds, and um, can you just get into as I talked to you with you uh, sometimes earlier, but uh, maybe people that are listening to this and watching this would like to know what would you say and how would you describe the person and the driver, David Reynolds? Okay. Well, um, in terms of the person, David's probably got the reputation of being um, what they call the class clown, I guess, in Australia. Um, I, I would just say that you know he's he's just an, he's an entertainer. He, he loves having a chat. Um, he doesn't mind having a laugh, cracking a joke. Um, so he's a little bit unpredictable, and as a result, you know the media and the TV tends to follow that and, and quite interested in what he has to say. Um, at times it works, other times it, it causes some trouble um, and some controversy and we saw that at Bathurst last year when 
David was unfortunately fined uh, 25,000 Australian dollars uh, for some comments uh, concerning or regarding his uh, female uh, teammates uh, that were entered in the uh, Bathurst 1000 race as a wildcard entry. So um, unfortunately, uh, that uh, attracted a lot of headlines and uh, made the news here in Australia nationally and uh, made news overseas and, and, the, and the severity of the fine was so significant that it you know, generated even more interest. So um, and we've also seen David do some fun things, you know, throwing pop paints off the podium. We've seen him drink his uh, champagne out of his race boots um, and carry on a bit. So in terms of his personality, that's, that's David, the character, and um, in terms of his racing ability, uh, well, David uh, had his best year in the uh, championship last year. He finished third in challenge for the championship. Uh, that despite um, uh, ongoing um, speculation about his contract uh, with Ford, and um, as we all now know, uh, by the end of it all, the contract uh, uh, ended and David uh, found a new home at Erebus Motorsport. Um, for those who don't know, Erebus is famous for their Mercedes E-Class uh, V8 supercar, supercars. They also enter AMG, GT, SLS, Mercedes in the um, GT Championship here and have them overseas. So uh, David's now with Erebus. Um, over summer, Erebus chose to move away from the Mercedes and are now racing at um, a local Holden Commodore. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about David. Mm. Yeah, um, uh, when he when he left, was it was it Pro Drive he left from? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, he left. So the official Ford factory team in Australia, Pro Drive Racing. Um, David was one of um, the teammates of Mark Winterbottom, uh, who's who won the championship last year, and David was uh, you know jostling with Mark for most of the season for the championship. In the end, David came third. He won a couple of races, quite a few podiums. Obviously made uh, more news at Bathurst when um, yeah, he, he got pole position the day after the uh, controversy of the fine and speculation. So he just tends to attract headlines, and um, as a result, he has a huge following here in Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> he sure sounds like a very interesting person for sure. <laughs> and um, I'm sure, at some stage you'll get to have a chat with yeah. him as well. And I can tell you for the people that are listening and watching this that we are actually been arranging an, an interview with uh, David Reynolds here on Motorsport Today podcast that I that I look very looking forward to uh, much and uh, it's gonna be interesting to to hear him talk a little bit about of course his his early years and his um, a touch a little bit on his private life and his racing career etc. But uh, I think uh, when when you get this opportunity to talk to people that are around athletes. Uh, a question that I, I, I guess you frequently get asked is, what sides to David Reynolds do you get to see that maybe not the media or other people's people don't get to see that you could sort of shed some light on that maybe you could talk about? Well, yeah, of course you do get to see the other side of them. You see their ups and their downs. Um, probably um, the, the most um, Interesting time uh, upon reflection was uh, you know last year, uh, middle of last year to late last year when David's contract was up for renewal. I think we saw you know David really uh, challenged um, when he got the fine at Bathurst. I mean you know all that publicity, a lot of criticism on social media about his comments, even though you know there were there was absolutely no harm intended, of course. Uh, but unfortunately, in a politically uh, correct society, um, everything scrutinised very very closely and, and, and those comments weren't well received by some people. He did have lots of support that people understood there was no harm intended, but um, unfortunately um, there's also the other side you need to uh, consider. So that was a time when I saw David probably with his back to the wall. Uh, there was a period there where, where David really, it, it looked like, you know, ironically that maybe he wasn't going to be racing in V8 supercars and that despite him being third in the championship and uh, such a popular and capable driver that, you know, could it be possible that he he, he wouldn't have a full-time drive. Well, you know, there was a moment there where uh, we had to have that chat to say, well, things haven't worked out. Um, we've got our backs to the wall. So there were a lot of people uh, questioning him, uh, questioning myself, and then questioning uh, our relationship. And so I found uh, David at that point in time was truly a very loyal person um, that was willing to um, fight very hard and, and uh, work hard to come to a resolution. So that's a time when... I probably saw the other side of David where he was under, the, under a lot of pressure, under a lot of stress, um, and, um, and we worked very well to get through it. So, 
yeah, he can be a pretty funny guy most of the time and very, very relaxed. But that was a time when I think he was uh, emotionally challenged as well. So it was an interesting time for us. Mm, yeah. And uh, for sure, you know, it has to be has to be good to have that close relationship with with uh, with the people you are managing and working with. And uh, you know, from from the outside, as you say, it's easy to get, make up your sort of opinions and sort of paint up a picture of a person. But you know, that's why I always want to hear both sides of the story because you know what you see in the media is one thing, and you know they are always angling things towards maybe um, an ob- objective that might not fit the true personality or how they sort of paint up the correct picture of the actual person. So hearing this from you, it definitely sheds a light on, on him as a person. And as, as you've seen on the track, he's doing a heck of a good job. He's really, you know, and if you get back to the, the race that was, you know, Townsville, and, and how would you describe that weekend from, from your view? Well, it was a, it was a really um, successful weekend. Um, it seems that the, the team and, and his uh, engineers and David had a plan uh, from the Friday right through the Saturday uh, with the objective of qualifying in the top 10 on Sunday and they did all of those things. Uh, clearly the car looked um, um, like it really has been engineered to a stage where it could potentially be a competitive um, a, a competitive um, entry amongst uh, the top 10. The car you know, just seemed to hold its own for the whole time. Dave seemed to hold it. Uh, together as well. I mean, he, he burst out of, I uh, think he started in fifth position or fourth or fifth, burst through um, the uh, start and ended up in, I think, third spot, second and third spot, that sort of thing, and um, held his own. Unfortunately, um, I mean, it looked like he was heading for a podium, but with about sort of 10 or 15 left to go, um, a, um, a pace car, sorry, or, or a um, safety car came out. Uh, uh, David had the option of going in for tyres. The engineer decided to leave him out, and unfortunately, that was uh, uh, worked to the uh, well didn't work out. Let's say, and although David was in third spot, his tyres faded very badly in those last laps, and uh, we couldn't believe it. He faded out of, out of the top ten into fourteenth spot. So very disappointing. But um, the big news was he qualified in the top ten. Uh, the car was fast throughout the session, so um, clearly they're doing something right over there at Erebus. Mm. And uh, from, from since you you touched on that, Airbus has been linked to Mercedes, uh, and and have been running Mercedes actually as well. So uh, switching to a different manufacturer and and sort of getting the R and D and and all the right people, uh, you know, sort of working in the right direction, having a new driver as well. Um, sort of what can you see inside a team specifically that you would say is shedding some light? For the future that's coming. Are you talking about Erebus? Exactly, the team Erebus. Erebus had um, look have had an amazing uh, 12 months. They've, they've uh, over summer uh, they uh, they had two new drivers come in, uh, Aaron Russell and uh, David Reynolds. Um, they moved uh, the V8 Supercar operation from Queensland, the whole operation from Queensland to Melbourne, which is a long distance. Uh, it's probably about 2,000 kilometres, so they had to move everything. They had to move their staff. Um, they set up the V8 supercar operation in Melbourne um, alongside the GT car operation um, to suit David Reynolds. Uh, so they've done a lot to build around David at the moment. They see David as the key and the foundation to future success. Um, then the big news was they moved from the Mercedes E-Class to a uh, Holden Commodore, which meant basically parking the Mercedes that they'd spent very many, well, many, many millions of dollars on developing to a whole new car, a brand new Holden Commodore, which they had no data on. Uh, they hadn't built themselves, they pretty much bought it from Walkinshaw Racing and had to develop it. So even on top of that, um, just uh, recently in the last couple of weeks, it was announced they're now going to move out of that uh, smaller factory in uh, um, Dandenong, which is uh, east of Melbourne, to um, a new facility. Uh, sorry, they were in uh, Moorabbin and they're moving to Dandenong, so east southeast of Melbourne here in Australia. So again, another significant upheaval for the team. So I have, I have to say that all things considered, you know, I think they're doing a fantastic job. Uh, they introduced some new sponsors, uh, Penrite, uh, Hungry Jacks, and uh, a number of other sponsors, and they've got a new driver in Dave. So you have to give them, you know, you have to give them credit. They're doing some very good things. Yeah, I actually didn't know that they actually did that much um, to sort of 
build themselves uh, around David. That, was, that is a huge commitment from, from a race team. I, I don't know if I've ever heard from, from the little racing experience I have, of course. That is quite significant. And uh, how do you think it's going to help him now, looking forward now? Because that's, that's, a big, that's a big deal. Well, it helps him significantly. It means he doesn't have to travel 2,000 kilometers each way every week. Um, it means he'll be amongst his crew, his engineers, pretty much every day he'll get to see them. And it means that they can build a culture um, around the driver and around the new crew. Uh, and you know, as I said before, the variables that go into a successful racing team are infinite. So you've got to get the right culture, you've got to get the right camaraderie amongst your crew. The driver has to have rapport with the crew and the engineers. They need to know each other. They need to be friends. They need to be able to communicate without necessarily talking to each other. So they've got to work as a team. So all being in one place, in one city, in one building, it's got to be, you know, it's got to be a bonus. It's got to be um, an advantage. Yeah, for sure. And I wish him all the best. That's going to be pretty darn interesting to see how this. Uh... Well, they're racing this weekend, so I can't wait. Today they start practicing with the um, yeah. two practices. Yeah, I actually saw um, that on, on the on the channel here. I saw the V8 supercar and and of course the name of the race. And I you know it's going to be pretty darn interesting to see how that's going to end. And I we are we're all at Motorsport Trip in our podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm forcing them to for vote, so go for Dave Reynolds. <laughs> um, but we can't forget to talk a little bit about Aaron Russell, and it's been some controversy here, and uh, it's been some. He's been a busy few uh, few days for him. And uh, what can you tell me about uh, that situation? Well, um, there was a lot of controversy over the last um, couple of weeks, um, speculation about Aaron Russell. Um, potentially not racing for the rest of the year. For those who don't know, Aaron Russell is a rookie. He's uh, David's teammate at Erebus Motorsport. And uh, sadly, during the week, it was confirmed that uh, Aaron would be uh, terminating his uh, agreement and um, and uh, would not be continuing full-time in the series for the rest of the year. Um, that, that's really unheard of in the sport. Um, so it uh, generated some news and uh, very disappointing, I would say, for Erebus, but also, of course, for Aaron. Mm, but yeah, and I can imagine, you know, because uh, I've been doing a little, little research about him, and he, from what I've seen, result-wise, he hasn't been able to have that opportunity to really show himself, and have, and it has to be tough mentally to be in a situation like this when you haven't really been able to, to really show exactly what you really can go for. Because although he has shown pr good promise, and uh, what would you say? What do you think about? What do you see for his future? Do you think he, he would find a, another way for into a series or into the series, or what would you say? That remains to be seen. I mean, it's very, very hard to get into the V8 supercars. So um, who knows? Uh, it's it's incredibly difficult to get an opportunity. So many planets have to align. You have to have your sponsorship. You have to have the right relationships. Uh, and you're right. We didn't see the the, the, uh, the ability of Aaron. Um, he was down the back of the grid most of the time. Um, naturally, they didn't have time to really develop the car. Um, so unfortunately, we never got to see what Aaron was capable of. But hopefully, um, you know, we'll see him again in the future, and uh, maybe he might pop up again in the endurance series. Maybe as a co-driver at Bathurst or something like that. So um, yeah, very disappointing for him. Yeah, so I would hope uh, that he finds uh, a solution to that because, you know, it's always nice to see these. You can, you can call them underdogs, you can call them upcoming young talents, you can call them whatever you want, but it's always good to see this fresh blood coming in with fresh attitude and uh, giving the, yeah. the old guys a little bit of a run for their money, as they say. So hopefully that works out for him. So uh, who? Uh, what can you tell me about the, or what do you know, I shall maybe say, about the replacement for Aaron Russell at uh, Erebus? Uh, all I know is uh, what was uh, announced this week um, in the media that Craig Baird, uh, a, a very, very seasoned and experienced New Zealand racer, um, who will also be actually David's co-driver at uh, the Bathurst and the Endurance Grounds, he's been called in uh, to race the car this weekend, and uh, that's as much as we know. So whether or not um, he continues, um, obviously he can't continue for the rest of the year because he needs to be co-driver with David. Um, so. Yeah, it remains to be seen who will race the car for the rest of the year. But that car that Aaron's um, entered into the series, that car will remain with Erebus, which is good news for Erebus. Um, and they'll have to basically fill the seat. So maybe it's an opportunity for Erebus to try some other drivers. 
don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But uh, yeah, very interesting times. Mm. And uh, I, I think uh, I don't know how many people actually know about your junior series or up sort of feeder series. You know, for Formula One, you have GP2, NASCAR has Truck Series, the Xfinity Series, and if I'm not mistaken, your series is called the Dunlop Series, where you sort of you can scout for talents. Yeah. And yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, now I want to play with the manager mind that is uh, John here. Um, is there any? sort of upcoming talent in the Dunlop series that has caught your eye in some way? Yeah, oh, well, there's lots. Um, um, well, there's, there's a number of drivers that are coming through the series at the moment. There's actually one of the most interesting um, uh, possibilities is a young kid called Alex Rullo. Alex is uh, the youngest of a V8 supercar driver. Um, um, uh, I think he was 15 years old when he got onto the podium for the first time uh, in a... Uh, in another feeder category or a support category. Mm. Uh, I think it's called V8 Tourers, but um, he's now racing in the development series, um, which is the series directly beneath um, the V8 supercars. Basically, they're the same cars, uh, but in a, a development um, series. So Alex is now only 16 years old. He's competing full time in this development series. Alex is only in, in school. He's a schoolboy. Jesus. And uh, officially will be the youngest ever V8 supercar driver. Just absolutely amazing. So uh, if there's anyone to watch, I'm watching Alex at the moment because it's just incredible to see this schoolboy with, um, you know, he's still little, he's still a little boy, uh, racing with these big boys uh, in a big series. Uh, just an amazing story. So keep an eye out for Alex Rulo. And we will. We'll try to catch him sometime maybe. <laughs> yeah, yes, well, he, he raced the whole Commodore. Um, it's it's entered by Lucas Dumbrell Motorsport, uh, which is where Andre Heimgartner drives. Uh, I, uh, I remember that that uh, race team. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's Lucas Dumbrell. You'll you'll notice on Alex Rulo's car, it's um, it's sponsored by Castrol Oil, um, and uh, he's uh, doing an incredible job at the moment. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep keep an eye on him. You know, you, you can always you only can always rely on John for for good great information, isn't that so? Man, come to me. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> but uh, I, I've, I've sort of watched a little bit about the Dunlop series. So you said they're basically the same cars, but is it like in the NASCAR Xfinity series where the cars have some difference in, in, in the engines or, or are the cars basically completely or more or less the same? Well, what they are is um, an older generation of cars. So pretty much once the, the main V8 supercar teams are have finished with their car or they're going to build a new one, they'll be fed down to the development series. So what's unique about that is you've got some of the older generation V8 supercar uh, spec cars and then you've got some of the um, car of the future spec. So um, basically you've got uh, also gen different generations of the Hulk and Commodore and the Ford Falcon racing. So there's a little bit of crossover, although they're basically all the same car, V8, uh, 5 litre, uh, rear wheel drive, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. There is actually some differences, which is quite interesting to see how they race differently on the track. So you've got Car of the Future uh, V8 supercars, which is the most recent spec of car, and competing against some of the older generation cars. And look, the, the main difference there is um, a transaxle setup in the Car of the Future um, model. So you've got that, and uh, you've got the fuel tank in front of the rear axle as opposed to the rear of the rear axle. Um, they're the main differences um, with the uh, car of the future versus the older spec car. Yeah, and uh, I know you are limited on time. And uh, before we sort of go our separate ways, as I shall say, uh, looking forward to this weekend. Um, what do you think is possible to achieve realistically? Well. Um... It's going to be an interesting weekend. I mean, uh, you've got Craig Baird coming out in Aaron's car. I can't imagine uh, we'll, we'll see much of Craig. I suspect you know he hasn't been in the Baird Super Car for a little while, so I, I don't think we'll see much improvement there, understandably. But you never know. They might have tried to bolt in some bits and pieces that David's got in his car into um, what was Aaron's car, and maybe we'll see some improvements. Uh, with Andre Heimgartner, um, I'm hoping to see a top 15 result from Andre this weekend with his uh, Holton Commodore Lucas Dunbrown Motorsport V8 supercar. Um, Andre's uh, had a good result um, at last round and uh, was uh, right amongst the mix of things, but unfortunately has had um, a bit of bad luck along the way. 
So I'd like to see Andre in the top 15 uh, with David. Well, it's a bit of an unknown. The team goes into, um, everybody's going into the round without any data on this car, remember? So it's a new car. So everything they're doing is almost trial and error. Um, they seem to be getting most things right recently, which is really good. Uh, look, it's hard to say. Um, if David and, and the team can have a similar setup that works uh, and translates well to um, Ipswich Raceway, then um, I would like to think that um, they should be gunning for a top 10 position. I think the podium's unlikely, and um, I think you'll probably find another mix of um, Red Bull racing on the podium. Um, I, I think Techno uh, is also due for um, a good result uh, with Will Davidson. And, um, and um, we might even see, I think, Chas Mostert um, in his super cheap uh, Ford Falcon yeah. uh, on the podium as well. So they're my prediction. Yeah, and also the bottle low. But the frosty. Yeah, well, that's it. That's right. Well, look, I mean, the only reason I didn't um, uh, predict Mark Winterbottom to be on um, the, the podium is that pretty much every round this year we've had a we've had a different winner. It's been absolutely brilliant. Absolutely. Uh, I see what you're doing. So, there. Yeah, given that Techno haven't had their win yet, I'm going to predict that they'll be the next um, uh, winner um, in the V8 Supercar around here at Ipswich. So, they're my predictions. All right, that's great to hear. Jon, it's been great to talk to you, and um, we everybody, go and tune in to a little bit of V8 Supercar, and you have to root for David Reynolds, and everybody at uh, Erebus, of course, but uh, mainly David Reynolds. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much, and it's been an absolute pleasure having you here, and I uh, hope we can talk again very soon. Okay, thank you.